understand the parable that we read as our worship text from Matthew 20, we have to remember the context within the book of Matthew. Jesus' disciples are struggling to understand how God's kingdom runs on God's grace. In Matthew 18, the disciples asked Jesus, who is the greatest in God's kingdom? And Jesus told them that they needed to become like little children or else they wouldn't even enter God's kingdom. In Matthew 19, parents were bringing their children to Jesus to be blessed by Jesus, and the disciples stopped the parents and wouldn't let the children come. And Jesus told them that God's kingdom is only for people who are willing to enter it like little children. And later on in Matthew 20, Jesus is going to be approached by James and John's mom, who will ask Jesus to give them the best places in God's kingdom. And Jesus is going to tell them that whoever wants to be great in God's kingdom must be the servant of all. The thing that they keep missing is Jesus' statements over and over is that he's on his way to Jerusalem to die on the cross to take away their sin. You see, Jesus is the greatest in God's kingdom because even though he's the king, he's also the servant of all who is serving us by giving his whole life for us, both in his living and his dying. Jesus modeled humility even as he told us to humble ourselves and accept God's kingdom as a gift. Now, in the midst of all these stories, a rich young ruler came and asked Jesus a question about how to get into God's kingdom or get eternal life. And that's the setup for this parable in Matthew 20. So let's quickly review the condensed version of the rich young ruler. He comes up and he says, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? And Jesus says, obey the commandments. Which ones, he says. The Ten Commandments summarized as, love your neighbor as yourself, Jesus replied. But what do I still lack, he asks. Jesus says, sell your possessions and give to the poor and then come follow me. And he went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus says, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And the disciples say, then who, who can be saved then? With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible, Jesus says. So then Peter says, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus says, you who have followed me and everyone who has left things for my sake will inherit eternal life. You see Peter's question, what will there be for us? Peter is echoing the same question he's been asking all along. Who will be the greatest? Who will get the most stuff? What do we get? Peter isn't content with Jesus' assurance that they will enter God's kingdom or inherit eternal life. Peter wants to know how much reward they're going to get. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all include this story of the rich young ruler, and they all include Peter's question and Jesus' answer that concludes with the first will be last and the last will be first. But only Matthew includes this parable in Matthew 20 that is thrown alongside. That's what a parable is. It's a teaching that's thrown alongside to help us understand or illustrate this point that the first will be last. And this parable has bookends around it. Matthew 19.30 says, many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. And then we get the parable of the workers in the vineyard, or another commentator called it the parable of the unexpected wages. And this parable concludes with, so the last will be first and the first will be last. It's interesting that the order is reversed before and after this parable. And that's what God's doing in all of this is flipping things on its head, which is the point of this parable. Those who think of themselves as first or greatest in God's kingdom need to be ready for others who are last and least to receive the same rewards as they get 
even though they have not worked as hard for them. And Jesus affirmed that his disciples would be rewarded for leaving everything behind to follow him. But Jesus clarifies that everyone who follows him will get the same reward of eternal life. We sing about God's grace, and we love God's grace when it's directed at us. But it's actually quite hard for us to accept that God is so gracious to others. So here's this first group of workers who are going to work for an agreed-upon wage. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. This is one of the kingdom parables. Jesus starts a lot of his parables with, the kingdom is like. And this is a vineyard parable. There's actually... Israel is the vineyard in a lot of parables in the Old Testament, and it looks like here in the New Testament also. And the landowner in all of these parables is God. And the owner goes out early in the morning. This is probably sunrise, what, they would have, what we would count as about 6 a.m. And the work day was measured from sunrise to sunset with 12 hours to work. That's a long work day. And he agreed to pay them. See, this group of workers were probably very happy to have this day's work. Some workers like this may have owned their own farms, but other poor workers would only work on the farms of others. We don't know exactly the situation of all these workers. But they've agreed to work for a denarius, which is also just translated as one silver coin. This is a day's wage. But the question is, is this low pay, average pay, or an excellent pay for a day's work? Some commentators think this is probably minimum wage, which always changes. Do you remember that just a few years ago we were fighting about whether minimum wage should be $15 an hour? And now that doesn't seem like very much money anymore. So other commentators think that this was probably the average day's wage. One silver coin was probably the standard payment for a day's wage. What we don't know is how much silver was in that coin, depending on how much other metal was being mixed in at this time. Even for them, a coin of the same size made of silver could have had varying values. Now, other commentators think that this is a fair day's wage or even a good day's wage. This was at least enough money that someone in advance, knowing they're agreeing to work for a full 12 hours, is going to agree to work for it in advance. Okay? Some people think this might even be an excellent day's wage. Soldiers in the Roman army were paid one denarius for a day. It's possible that the average farm laborer would not have expected to receive the same as the average soldier. Okay? There's a good chance that this was even a higher than average wage that a farmhand would expect to earn in one day. Okay? Just remember that. This is at least fair pay for a day's wage, and it might even be a very good wage, even for the guys in the morning. Now, the middle group of workers come, and they're going to work for whatever is right. About the third hour, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, and he did the same thing. See, he went out again. The landowner ap appears to be very eager to get all of his grapes harvested this day. The third hour, that's the third hour from sunrise, that's 9 a.m., he went out the sixth hour again, which is the sixth hour from sunrise, which is 12 p.m., and then he went out the ninth hour from sunrise, which is 3 p.m., and he agrees to pay this group whatever is right. And these workers appear eager enough for work not to negotiate the exact details of pay. They're just going to trust the landowner will pay them whatever is right. This is the word for just or fair. 
they expect probably an appropriate fraction of a denarius based on the fraction of the day that they're working. Which brings us to this last group of workers, and they're working for whatever the landowner decides. About the eleventh hour, he went out and found still others standing around, and he asked them, Why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, You also go and work in my vineyard. You see, he went out again at the very end of the day. Hiring anyone this late in the day starts to look more like charity. Up to this point, it looks like he's just been excited about his grape harvest, but to hire people at the last minute may have been, they may have understood he was being nice to them. See, the 11th hour from sunrise is 5 p.m. The 12th hour from sunrise is 6 p.m., which was quitting time. And he says to them that they're standing around doing nothing, or other translations of the Bible say they were standing idle. This could be taken as an accusation that they're lazy or even getting up to no good. Why are you guys standing around here? But they say that they're only standing around because they haven't been hired. They want to work. And it's interesting that this time we don't get any details of the payment agreement. That They just get an offer to work and they take it. This last group is completely at the mercy of the landowner and it looks like they know it okay which brings us to the end of the day when all three groups received equal pay when evening came the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman call the workers and pay them their wages beginning with the last ones hired and going to the first the workers who were hired about the 11th hour came and each received a denarius so when they came when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. It says, when evening came... Night is symbolically the time of judgment. And the evening is the twelfth hour from sunrise, 6 p.m. It's quitting time. And he said, pay their wages. The Old Testament law required payment for work on the same day as the work. For poor laborers, this is the only way they're going to eat that day, get a place to sleep that night. They need their money to be paid the same day as the work. But the landowner says, pay the, them beginning with the last one. This was not required, and it was not normal. The landowner is intentionally reversing the order of the payment that the foreman would have used in order to show the first group what the last group received for an effect in this story. Jesus is adding this part because he's, he's telling Peter, you're, let me show you what you're like. Okay? And sure enough, the landowner in the story gets the effect that Jesus wanted to demonstrate to Peter. You have made us all equal. Isn't that terrible? Can you imagine people being made equal? See, we, we say we want equality, but when we get it, it turns out we usually wanted more. At which point do you think gratitude converted to envy in this story? Was the second group hired still grateful for a full day's wage, even though they didn't work a full day? Was it the third group? I mean, was, you see what I'm saying? Everyone who got paid a full denarius for less than a full day's work should have been grateful. But I bet if you ask them, I bet this ingratitude maybe even started down at the people hired at the ninth hour. That's the way we are. We have borne the burden of the work. That sounds like the older brother's complaint in the story of the prodigal son. I'm always working. This was also the rich young ruler's attitude toward God's reward. He thought he'd earned it. What do I need to do? Let me fulfill this contract and I'll get the reward. 
And it says that when they got paid, they grumbled. The, the word translated as grumbled here is an onomatopoeia for the noise you make when you're mumbling. They, as soon as they get the pay, they start going... Oh, 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 oh. You, you ever hear that noise coming out of your mouth even if there's no words behind it? I do. Grumbling is the, the, the word used to translate what the Israelites did in the wilderness when they did not get God's blessings on their schedule over and over and over again. And grumbling is what we usually do when we see God bless others more than he blesses us. Which brings us to the moral of the parable. The last will be first, and the first will be last. But he answered one of them, Friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So, the last will be first, and the first will be last. He called him friend. This is a term of endearment or equality. It's also a polite way to address a stranger. But in the book of Matthew, friend is always used as the polite way to start a rebuke. Jesus, when Jesus says, friend, you know something a little bit unfriendly is probably going to fall. <laughs> and he says, you guys are envious. This is literally, you have an evil eye. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, if your eye is darkened, then everything you see will be darkness. When your eye, which is actually referring to your heart, is evil, what you see isn't evil, it's the eye you're seeing it with that's evil. The, the, the landowner is saying, you're not seeing anything bad going on, your eye is what's making this look bad. And this denarius or money, what, what does the payment represent in this parable? You see, this isn't primarily a story about avoiding greed, but about entering God's kingdom humbly as little children instead of as a rich, righteous, great person who thinks they deserve it. Remember, that that's the treasure that we're talking about here, is that the rich young ruler thought he could get into God's kingdom, and the, and the disciples say, we want, what are we going to get? We're, we're talking about rewards in heaven, not just physical money here. But the man says, the landowner says, don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? This echoes God's words to Moses. When God walked in front of Moses, showing his glory and describing his glory, God said, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. I have the right to show grace to people. And what we're talking about is what the landowner wants. This is what God chooses, wills, or decides. And we are pretty quick to tell God that he's wrong, especially when God is too forgiving to others. You remember how the book of Jonah ends? With Jonah saying, why'd you be so nice to them? I can't believe you did that. But here's the deal. To question God's grace for others is to risk losing God's grace for ourselves. Remember the older brother and the prodigal son. He refused to go into the feast. That is the picture of the kingdom of heaven because his undeserving little brother was invited to. Remember how the Pharisees saw Jesus eating with sinners, feasting with them, and they didn't want to eat with Jesus because Jesus was eating with other people who didn't deserve it. Don't miss out on feasting with Jesus because he's being gracious to other people. Jesus says the first will be last and the last will be first, which completes the bookends around this parable. And another way of stating this moral is the last will be first and the first will be upset about it. In Mark, this the first will be last and the last will be first was also part of Jesus' answer to the disciples' earlier question about 
who was the greatest in God's kingdom. And in Luke, the first will be last and the last will be first is part of Jesus' explanation of why Gentiles are getting into God's kingdom while some of God's own people, the Jews, are not getting in. You see, the last being first is only good news for no, those who know that they deserve to be last. And our response to God's generosity to others who are undeserving shows what we think we deserve. So what should we do in light of the fact that the first will be last and the last will be first? You know, some commentators have a hard time identifying what what the wage is in this parable. Uh, some commentators say this wage can't actually be eternal life because we don't work for salvation at all. We receive it by faith. But Hebrews 11.6 describes true faith in God this way. It says, Anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. That's what faith is. Our work should not be done in order to earn God's favor, but it should be done trusting God to be generous. And our desire to leave everything and follow Jesus, trusting him to reward us, is appropriate. Other commentators say this equal wage for all the workers can't be rewards in heaven because there's other places where God rewards people differently for their different works. In Matthew 25, we're going to see the parable of the talents, where different servants receive different rewards in their master's kingdom based on their actions while he's away. Likewise, Paul uses two analogies in 1 Corinthians 3 that sound like Jesus' parables on rewards. First, Paul says we're God's field, with different people working to plant and water, but God's the one making the plants grow. In this first analogy, it emphasizes God's role in producing what's going on more than ours. The second analogy is that we're God's building, and we build our lives on Jesus as the foundation, and we're rewarded based on what survives the fire of God's judgment. In that one, it sounds more like an emphasis on what we're doing, being the, the definitive uh, thing about what survives that fire. This is the tricky part about parables. You can't match everything in a parable, try to figure out what everything in a parable means. Okay? We've got to ask, what was the point of this parable? And the emphasis in this parable is on the worker's attitude towards God's grace, giving both salvation and rewards to other people, other workers, who we don't think deserve either God's salvation or God's rewards as much as we do. Right? That's, that's the point of this parable. Quit focusing on what God is do doing to other people and be grateful for what God is doing for you. See, when the question is, does God really want me to work in his kingdom, the answer is yes. But when the question is, can I earn my way into God's kingdom, or can I earn a better place in God's kingdom? The answer is always, God's kingdom doesn't work that way. It runs on God's grace, not on your work. They found a similar story outside the Bible. And it's unclear whether someone was responding to Jesus' parable, or whether Jesus was taking a pre-existing story and flipping it on its head. All we know for sure is that the ending in Jesus' version is the opposite of the ending in the other version. In the extra-biblical version of this story, the, the workers who are hired later get paid the fractional denarius that, that we expected them to receive, and then they're the ones who complain at the end of the story, and the landowner tells them, you only get what you work for. You see, we, we actually like that ending of the story better. <laughs> when things go well for us, we want to believe in karma, that, that we deserve it. The good things we've done in the past add up to good results, 
We don't want to say that we're getting even the good things in our life by God's grace. Now, who we envy may change over time, but Jesus' point stays the same. God's kindness is designed to lead us to repentance, it says in Romans 2. But instead, when we see God's kindness, we often resent it when God is giving grace to others. See, Jesus' original disciples were not to envy those who came later. Likewise, lifelong Christians are not to envy those saved on their deathbeds. Jews were not to envy the Gentiles. The righteous were not to envy sinners. And early Christians struggling with God treating Jews and Gentiles equally was because they noticed that God was treating unrighteous people from unrighteous parents whose culture has been unrighteous for years and years. He's treating them the same way as us good people whose parents were good who have been God's people for years and years. See that? Even the Jew-Gentile fight was over God giving grace to people who didn't deserve it. Those two issues are actually the cause of offense that's addressed in the book of Galatians. And God's grace to sinners is what offended everyone in Martin Luther's day about the gospel too. Did you know that Martin Luther quoted this parable in the 95 Theses? Thesis number 63 says, The treasure of the gospel of grace is deservedly the most hated because it makes the first last. See, those who have given up their whole lives to follow Jesus don't like it when God gives grace to others. In our day, we need to hear that this parable is also not just about justice. In fact, it's not about justice at all. This is about mercy and grace that everyone but the first workers received. This parable is not a recommendation for labor laws. God's kingdom has different rules than the world does. The world works this way. Even monkeys envy each other when they get a different reward for doing the same activity. They they are jealous of each other too. You can see this on YouTube. There's videos of these very funny uh, monkeys not being able to uh, be happy getting a piece of cucumber when another monkey gets a grape for doing the same thing. (laughs) The point of this parable is that God is generous. God is righteous and good even when he's not fair. If we're honest, even those of us who identify most with the first group of people in this parable are getting God's grace when we receive the denarius, when we get into God's kingdom, when we receive eternal life. And remembering that God forgives us our debt affects how we forgive others. God gives us better than we deserve. And he gives others better than they deserve, too. And being thankful for God's grace to us helps us to be thankful for God's grace to others. I want you to hear the good news of the gospel that is for you and for everyone else. Jesus always did everything right, from sunrise to quitting time, from his birth to his death. He lived and died in your place. And he rose again to give you the life that he alone deserves based on his work. And he returned to heaven as the rightful owner of everything. And he will return at the end of the day, at the end of time, to reward all those who have followed him whether they've worked for a long time or a short time. And in Jesus, your sin is forgiven. You get into God's kingdom. You get eternal life because of Jesus' work, not yours. You inherit eternal life because Jesus earned it. And you are rewarded because God is generous. 
So take your pay and go in peace, not envying others, but enjoying your forgiveness.